appreciate the introduction, Ron. Thank you so much. And uh, I, listen, we've had some fantastic presenters this morning and this afternoon talking about technology to a great amount of depth. I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, right? I'm going to talk about money. Because ultimately, we do all this to basically increase our top line and decrease our bottom line, right? And we want it's all about profitability. And of course, we all, you know, we all migrated to cloud for that reason, right? And we want to be able to, uh, right? We want to be able to save money, right? That's what we're all sold on. Cloud saves money. We get is amount, you know, we get uh, flexible and optimized cloud computing, you know, whenever we want it. But you know, as we basically lifted the ship to the cloud and we refactored, re-architected application, we built cloud native applications, you know, where are all the savings? Right? I spent a lot of time with a lot of uh, C-level executives and CFOs, and honestly, most of the CFOs were asking, you know, where are my savings? Right? I'm, I'm seeing uh, my costs go up. Now, the costs aren't going up simply because we're going to the cloud, I and mean, there's lots of reasons, but certainly the cloud, the, the cloud migration has not necessarily return you know massive amounts of savings back to these companies and you know do we measure success by simply running in the cloud or do we want to measure success by optimizing the five things i showed here at the bottom right in this slide cost security performance operations and reliability because if we optimize on all five of those axes versus only simply running in the cloud then we're sure to deliver you know life cycle holistic savings back to your organization because ultimately, that's what this is all about. So looking at it from a why is this difficult perspective, right? Optimizing those five things is non-trivial. It's not easy. You know, what I see with most of the companies, so you heard Elizabeth talk earlier, she talked about the fact that, you know, large organizations have double-digit cloud providers, right? So basically, lots of people across the organization are setting up different cloud infrastructure with different accounts and different access points. So really, from a governor's perspective, you know, do we know who's in the cloud doing what from our company? I mean, that's really difficult, right, getting that unified visibility. The second one, and again, we just heard from some speakers around the world about data security and about, uh, about protecting your data. But you know, all of these compliance standards that you have to deal with, all of the security standards you have to deal with, you know, they change from country to country. They change from region to region. So being able to run in region, protecting your data in that region, and then complying with the, the standards and the requirements of that particular local government is exceedingly difficult, again, when you get into multiple clouds. You know, we hear, of course, hear a lot about cloud costs and, and budgets, right? There's a lot of tools out there that help you kind of give you oversight or give you some sort of reporting on what the cloud spend looks like. What you don't get is, well, where's that coming from? Am I right-sized for my particular workload? What is my forecast based on how we're using a cloud, right? Which which accounts are likely to overrun their budgets, right? All that insight, which transitions from reporting to basically uh, uh, governance, that's lacking today in, in most of these tools. Look at it from a resource consistency and visibility perspective. Again, as lots of people, you know, roll out cloud computing resource across the entire organization, you know, do we know that they're all configured in a particular standard way? Do we have the right level of patching and all the resources? Are we encrypting all the hard disks? Are all the ports protected that we need protected from an infrastructure perspective? That resource consistency that gives us the safety that we need is missing. And then finally, as people go into multiple hyperscalers, they find that operationally they need different teams because each cloud requires a different skill set and each cloud then requires a different team. So now operationally, you know what? used to be you know five or six or eight people doing this now there's 15 people doing this right because each cloud requires different people and the operational costs are, are going uh, you know off the rails so you know while we're trying to optimize our cloud infrastructure so that we're delivering these bottom line benefits to organization you know it's these complexities that make it really difficult and that's why cloud governance really can't be an afterthought anymore i think through the pandemic as companies basically moved in mass to the cloud, your governance took a second, took a back seat to that conversation. But that is not clearly changing. Most CEOs, CFOs, CIOs are saying, I need to now get my arms around what we're doing in the cloud, and, and I need to basically understand where this is all going. And in fact, if you look at it from a governance perspective, you know, how do we address those challenges? The hyperscalers absolutely recognize the value in providing that level of competency, that level of 
operational efficiency. So every hyperscaler has, has developed and has put forth a well-architected framework, right? So you see the AWS one, the Azure one, the Google Cloud one, and there's basically five pillars to each one of their approaches. And there's a lot of redundancy, a lot of overlap between how each hyperscale is providing it because these are generally good ideas, right? We need to basically architect applications that adhere to these pillars and principles so that we can see those cloud benefits in terms of dollars that we expect to see right from the get-go. And what we, of course, like have done is we've taken the raw architected frameworks of each one of the hyperscalers and abstracted them into an abstraction layer that we call OSCO. And OSCO stands for Operations, Security and Compliance, Cost, Access, and Resource. So now OSCO basically gives you a single pane of glass, a single prism from which you can basically execute well-architected frameworks across all three hyperscalers and get all the benefits of these well-architected frameworks to, again, deliver on the promise of the cost savings that we were expected to see from going to the cloud. Right, so OSCO has a lot of capability Again, because it supports all three of these uh, WAF frameworks and can kind of walk you through it, you know, we feel that if you can basically deliver on the on the frameworks, right, via Oscar, you're basically building what we refer to as cost-aware architected applications. So these architected applications are actually trying to reduce your cost, right? That's the bottom line. That's what we're going after. You know, look at the operation side of it, right? As I indicated earlier. You know, I do a lot of work with companies like GE Healthcare and, and some other large organizations, and we find that when they go to multiple accounts, you know, it, their operational costs just blow up, right? They have, you know, dozens of people now working in terms of operating these cloud infrastructures, and by, by of course, that providing a single pane of glass across all three of the hyperscale uh, clouds, you can now operate, you know, with a much, much smaller team, a lean team that can basically implement and operate that entire cloud or multiple clouds. Security and compliance, of course, is a big deal. You know, course that comes with 1,500 security and compliance standards built into the product. You basically pick and choose what you want to deploy, and we deploy those compliance standards throughout your organization, and now you have that level of security and compliance, which is then measured and reported on in real time via dashboards, right? So this is not point in time. This happens continuously, and it's reported on in real time. From a cost perspective, we're not simply a reporting tool, we're actually a recommendation engine. Right? We're gonna tell you exactly where the savings are and even potentially auto-remediate you maximizing and recognizing those savings. Right? So this is a second generation capability, not like the first generation ones we saw, we might have seen with uh, products like Cloud Health and Cloud Check, right? Very, very good products, but good at reporting, not necessarily the governance side of it. Access control is obviously one of the most important elements of securing your cloud infrastructure. So we provide this in spades in terms of how do we, you know, who can access what and when and having a centralized way of doing that. And then finally, resource visibility, right? You know, candidly, all of this starts by gaining resource visibility and accountability via tagging. But this is, of course, a very important thing. And we can automatically generate all of this stuff as, a, uh, as an automated way of doing it. And, you know, and, and the overarching sort of theme here is that while there are technologies available in each one of these buckets that I would characterize as first generation technologies, what we of course like have done is integrated all this stuff together under the Oscar framework and provide this as a second generation capability under a single pane of glass, right? And that is a key, key differentiator for us because we're bringing all this capability into an environment where most CIOs and CTOs want to rationalize their tool set so we actually help guide that rationalization exercise by giving you all this capability under a single pane of glass. And then, of course, going from reporting through auto remediation as a core capability from first generation moving to the second generation. How does the, stuff, how does the course stack work? In three easy steps, right? You simply onboard your cloud accounts. Sometimes we need read-write privilege if you want to do auto remediation. If we're simply reading the stuff and, and reporting on it, all we need are read access privileges. Then we apply guardrail. Right, like I said earlier, all this stuff is uh, you know, pre-built in core stack, so you can just apply the guardrails coming out of core stack by checking off boxes, or you can create your own guardrails. You can say, hey, for my industry, for my business, I need a particular security policy, I need a particular compliance standard, I have a particular budgetary profile, I have a particular access control need, right? All this stuff, particular cloud operations capability I'm looking for, 
I can create the stuff if I need to, or I can take the stuff that comes out of the box and apply those guardrails again by checking boxes. And so as I do that, I'm now getting an optimized, well-architected cloud environment. Right? I am now beginning and able to recognize the primary benefit of why I went to the cloud, which is to save my organization money at the bottom line. Right? So, so here's a quick example of what a uh, you know what we as an output, right? So on the well-architected framework side, you know, we have dashboards and we have reports, right, that'll tell you exactly how well you know, your application or your environment is behaving as with respect to the well-architected framework. We're checking for almost 400 different elements that that Azure or, or AWS or Google are actually recommending, right? So we have a long laundry list of things that we're checking for and making those continuous real-time recommendations to your to the organization, right? And then when we find things that are outside of compliance, you can either uh, you know remediate it via approval, which means you know we'll tell you what it is. You can basically say yeah, take that action or don't take the action, or you can set it to auto remediate for certain capabilities. Right, you know, for example, uh, you know, you may have capabilities requires every hard disk to be encrypted. We can auto remediate that. So if somebody basically provisions a computing resource that got storage, it's immediately encrypted. Right, whether they whether they do it or not, we'll basically optimize. Right. So the key takeaway here is, you know, if you really want to recognize the value of 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 cloud and and you know and all the hyperscalers are saying that to maximize the value you see in the cloud is by following these well architected frameworks which have five pillars. Well, if you want to optimize those five pillars, course that gives you the capability of optimizing on each of those five levels by by using our technology under single pane of glass, right? And to me, that is the definition of how we are being successful in the cloud, not necessarily just running things in the cloud. So that was relatively short and sweet. Hopefully uh, you guys see some value in that. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'm available at bob at coursedoc.io should you have any uh, follow-ups that you want me to do. Hey, Bob, that was great. We did have a question from Ted from the FAA. He specifically wanted to know, how do you integrate with ITSM or other monitoring tools? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a great question, right? So, you know, being an enterprise cap uh, capable technology, we integrate into most of the ITSM tools, right? ServiceNow, uh, Jira, right? We're integrating to the APM tools like CAPM and Splunk and, and Datadog, right? The list is a lengthy one, but we integrate into all of those technologies. Got it. Good to know. And so, again, Ted, I'll put you in touch with Bob so we can find out exactly what your current tools are and the good thing about the core stack solution that many people have commented to me is that it's easy to deploy. It's not a rip and replace. It's compatible and simply enhances what you currently have. And I think, you know, as they talk about and we hear about this a lot, in fact, we've got a program next week in automation. They just want to take away a lot of these tedious tasks that may not get done correctly. And so you get the dual benefit of the automated compliance done more accurately and freeing you and your team up to do more valuable tools. Uh, Bob mentioned at the start that this was a financially oriented talk. I might take a different spin on that. Not only is it going to save your boss money as far as your CapEx and OpEx budgets, it will help you make more money because you will become a more valuable employee by ensuring that the CEO, CIO, CFO, know that they're in compliance with an increasingly complicated regulatory environment. You'll be more secure and you will also free yourself up from the tedious tasks that are often error prone. Is that a reasonable summary there, Bob? Yeah, that's perfect, Ron. And the one thing I would add to that is that, you know, you're absolutely right, right? I mean, it's a lot of wide product. that's kind of deep capability. We chunk up the product into three separate modules, FinOps, CloudOps, and SecOps. And, and our customers are able to deploy those on a modular basis, right? So many of our customers say, hey, we already have a solution for FinOps that we're happy with. Well, that's great. We can start with compliance and SecOps. Or some of our customers have a great security solution, but they really want the integrated FinOps cloud ops, right? And, and if you think about it for a step back, just kind of go down that thread one extra minute, uh, you know, not, not having a handle on cloud ops to see which workloads utilization looks like, you know, how do you actually do effective FinOps? It, it's kind of difficult, right? Because you can report on FinOps fine, but you really can't do FinOps without having a great handle on cloud ops. So again, this is where we see the second generation capability, and this is where a lot of customers see value. Got it. 
And, you know, again, that's why you know, I say in the Holiday Inn Express because I sound smart, but as soon as you talk, start talking about the little subtleties of uh, FinOps, DevOps, you know, ops is the latest buzzword. <laughs> we, we, we at Angel made up a reasonably good pulse of what's important, but we rely upon experts like Bob to actually make this work. 